Unbeknownst to me, when he went back to his office, the operator of the property was there with a checkbook ready to buy the royalty. And since then, I found 50 million ounces of gold. And all came for free. Pierre, you and Seymour Schulich started Franco Nevada in 1985, and it is now the world's largest precious metals royalty company. And I want to examine why royalties are important to both mining companies and also investors. And why don't we just start with mining companies? Why would a mining company enter into a royalty? What are the benefits of doing so? Uh, for a uh, mining company, the uh, royalty financing is sort of in between an equity financing and um, uh, but at a lower cost than equity financing because you're selling part of your deposit instead of selling just like equity. So it's very much less dilutive for the shareholders. It is equity in the sense that uh, the uh, royalty holder doesn't run the mine. You know, the operator does everything, and but yet the royalty holder takes the same risk in terms of mining risk, country risk, and whatever as the operator. So it's on the same side. It's not a debt. It's not a preferred. It's just equity. And uh, it comes, when you look at the multiple that the royalty companies are willing to pay for streaming royalties, uh, it's far better than an equity deal, at, you know, and most of the time, I mean, sometimes if your, you know, stock sells at two or three times the NAV, at that point in time, you're better off to, you know, get the money in the market. Uh, but in today's market, where most companies are selling at a discount to their NAV, uh, they're much better off to do a uh, royalty deal. Pierre, let's examine the reasons or the benefits now why an investor should invest in a royalty company. And the number one element in my mind would be diversification. You're not exposed to 5, 10, or 15 producing mines. So you, in the case of Franco Nevada, they have over 400 royalties, over 100 of which are producing mines. Then you also have the element of not being exposed to capex or operating expenditures associated with cost inflation. But the one thing that really stands out in my mind where you can really reap or create shareholder wealth is optionality. Can you just tell us about optionality and the different types of optionality? Absolutely. And uh, I always say, uh, give me free optionality and I'll make you a millionaire. Because uh, optionality in our business is not understood and it's you know, undervalue uh, because no one calculates it. Uh, but it is the key to the Franco Nevada uh, success. As you pointed out, there's two kinds of optionality. There's uh, price optionality and land. Price, everybody understands it. It's very simple. In the case of a, a pure royalty, uh, if the gold price goes from a thousand to two thousand dollars an ounce, the royalty holder gets, you know, a thousand dollar increase in its revenue and in its profit because, you know, there's no cost. So if uh, you're getting, you know, a hundred thousand ounces at a thousand dollars an ounce, now all of a sudden it's a thousand, you know, at two thousand dollars an ounce. So that's very understandable. Um, the most incredible optionality is land optionality. When we buy a royalty over a land package, let's say 60,000 acres of land in the middle of Nevada, the mine over which we have a royalty will have resource reserves that are fixed. But then the operator will put up a billion or two to put the mine into production. And then the operator has all the incentive in the world to keep exploring to be able to use that capex, that capital, for as long as he can. So the operator will start, you know, like putting 10, 20, 50 million a year in exploration at no cost to the royalty holder. Same if you're a streaming company, you still don't pay any of the exploration. And yet you get all the benefits of it. And as the operator reduces the um, the cutoff grade, the operator's cost goes up, but for the royalty holder, it's the same. You know, it, they, they, they don't have operating costs or they're fixed. So 
its margin goes up with time. And that is the real beauty of uh, the uh, LAN uh, optionality. Now, I can give you the best example of it all, okay? Which happens to be the very first deal I did, which happens to be the best deal that I'll ever do in my entire life, which is kind of sad at the end of the day that your first deal turns out to be your best deal ever. But that is the case. After Seymour and I created Franco Nevada, we had um, raised $2 million. And we were saying to ourselves, what are we going to do with the money? And it took us about 18 months to figure it out that we wanted to try royalties. Okay? And the model came from the oil and gas business because that's where Seymour came from. And we were trying to find a model where we wouldn't have to you know, raise money every six months or every year and dilute ourselves all the time or have to put up money all the time to keep the company afloat. And that's where the royalty model came from. So at that time, Seymour asked me, he said, like, well, do you know of any mining royalties? I said, well, I know a few, but like no one had ever really uh, talked about it. Or, of course, there was no business model to, you know, uh, create a mining company based on royalties. So we were working in Nevada. And uh, while I was there, uh, my chief uh, geologist said, well, what else are you guys looking for? I said, well, if you see any royalties, like, give me a call because, you know, we would like to, to get into royalties, get by one or two. And so it, three months later, this uh, geologist was in his office in Reno, um, Friday morning, 9 a.m., reading the Reno Gazette with uh, sipping his coffee. And on page three, there's a box ad, royalty for sale with a phone number. So he calls up the phone number. It turns out to be someone in Texas. And um, they, he got started talking. And where's the royalty? Where's well, in the Carlin Tran of Nevada? He calls me up. He said, Pierre, I think I found your first royalty. Uh, where is it? The Carlin Tran of Nevada. Well, it turns out that like six months before, I had done a, a study for myself and Seymour about the cost of finding an ounce of gold. Because I said to Seymour, if we're going to be in that business, where is the cheapest place to find an ounce of gold? That's where we ought to be. And that was actually the Carlin trend of Nevada. In those days, they were finding gold for like $7 an ounce, which was incredible. We're talking here in the early 1980s. So to make a long story short, I told my geo, tell the guy to meet me in his office in Salt Lake City Monday morning. So over the weekend, I did my work. Sunday night, I flew to Salt Lake City. Monday, 9 a.m., I walked in the office of the seller. We started talking. And Seymour and I had agreed that um, the fair price was $1 million. So at the time, uh, there were uh, about 500,000 ounces of resource on the property, divided up in about six, seven little pits that they were mining at the rate of about 30 to 35,000 ounces a year out of like, you know, small 35 ton haul trucks and like, you know, it, like a, a very custom operation. Mom and pop, I would say. Anyway, I made them an offer, half a million, nothing, 750, no. Then I went like a million, not at all. And then he told me that um, he had a $2 million bank loan the bank had called a loan. He had 90 days to repay or they were going to put him in bankruptcy. So all of a sudden, it was $2 million or nothing. He didn't have any other asset that he could sell. So I, I can still see myself like going through the numbers in my head of what's there. The gold price was three fifty, dollars um, And then like, so finally, I said to him, I said, look, I said, um, you have a deal, but I have to call my partner. So I called up Seymour and I said, Seymour, I have good news and I have bad news. He said, well, what's the good news? I said, well, we have bought our first royalty and I think we're going to make like five times our money. I didn't know, but I had to give him something. And he said, well, what's the bad news? I said, well, we got no more money because that was all the money we had in the treasury. 
And he went nuts on me. He said, Lausanne, are you F crazy? What are you doing? Like, you know, he went on and on. Finally, I hung up. And I said to the guy, I said, look, let's go downstairs. Our lawyers are there. They're in the same building. We'll give it to them. The terms dictate the whole thing. You and I go have lunch. We have a bottle of wine. We come back. We sign. We're done. He agreed. We did exactly that. We, we came back, we signed, I shake can, and I left, and I returned back to Toronto. Unbeknownst to me, when he went back to his office, the operator of the property was there with a checkbook ready to buy the royalty. Imagine carpe diem. That's one of my tenants, okay, like seize the day. That royalty that I bought for $2 million dollars, a year later, Barrick bought the property, started drilling, and since then, I've found 50 million ounces of gold. That royalty has paid Franco Nevada well over a billion dollars US so far, and there will be another 500 million coming. That's what I called land optionality, and it all came for free. That's quite a story. Now, I'm curious when you, okay, so you had $2 million. You and Seymour discussed that you were going to pay no more, more than a million dollars for this asset. You ended up paying $2 million. To go from $1 million to $2 million, that's a big increase, right? But I'm just wondering, what was it about the asset you thought you were confident about? Well, the asset was being operated. And at the end of the day, the question I asked myself was, will I get my money back? That is like if you ask anybody at Franco Nevada today, what would Pierre ask? That's the question I ask. When am I going to get my money back? Okay, uh, because our business is a bit like the casino. As long as you get your money back, you can always go play. But once you lose your money, it's really tough, you know, to go raise more to go play. So I always want to know when I get my money back. In this particular instance, the original deal that we had, the $1 million, we had calculated essentially like on a three-year payback. It was a bit aggressive, okay? Uh, but there was like, we didn't have any reference point. We didn't know, like nobody had ever bought any of these. It was a private transaction and we didn't know. So when I was thinking about it, like, you know, will I pay $2 million? Okay, I'm going to take six years at 350. If the gold price goes up to 400, now I'm back at five years. In the meantime, I'm going to get like, you know, a good return. And it, there's enough reserve to last like twice that. So in my mind, it was a workable deal. And uh, that's why at the end of the day, like Seymour agreed with the deal. We were maybe like, you know, again, aggressive, but there was no comparison today. All these deals, there's always like two, three bidders, um, and uh, it's, it's very competitive. And when did that deal conclude? Uh, it was uh, March, April uh, 17, uh, 1987. And how long after the fact did you realize, oh my God, we really have something here? Uh, it was only about a year later, because what happened there is that the operator of the property um, they wanted to sell the property. So they drilled one hole that was like a thousand feet of like a third of an ounce gold. But the operator thought that they had drilled down a vein. And so they put up the property for sale thinking they were going to fool people. Okay. Well, Bob Smith, who was the uh, CEO of Barrick at the time, when he saw that, he figured that, like I did, that the rock package was so big because it was sediment that there was a lot more there. And so Barrick bought the property for about 75 million US and then started drilling. And the first three holes, they offset that hole and they got the same thing, a thousand feet. And then I remember of, of a third of an ounce, I remember, you know, Bob says like, well, I'll go drill 100 feet away because I don't believe it. And then they got the same result. And he still would not announce it. And so, well, I'll go drill 100 feet the other side. They got the same thing. And finally, they put out the result. And it's at that point, I said, no, no, no. This property is going to have a minimum of like 5 million ounces. And then they drilled a few more. And I said, no, it's going to be 10. And people were like, Lasana's like completely flipped out. He's gone. Okay, like, you know. 
I said, no, look at the thickness of the rock package and how uniform those are. And you'll see, and, and guess what? At the end of the day, like 50 million ounces. And they drilled the best gold hole I have ever, ever seen in my lifetime. It was a thousand feet of one ounce gold. Imagine that, a thousand feet thick of one ounce gold. You don't see that today. I haven't seen anything like it in 40 years. Yeah. So that one asset became a company maker, not only for Franco Nevada, but also Barrick Gold. Exactly. It became a company maker for both Franco and Barrick. Yeah. Pierre, I want to ask you about investing now and how you manage your own wealth when it comes to mining specifically. And I know you have a great deal of your wealth tied up into Franco Nevada, but what about gold producers or developers or explore -co's? I have found over the years that uh, the best place to get involved in a mining company is um, at the, uh, the second turn of the Lausanne curve. I, mean, I don't know if you remember, like back about 30 years ago, I created a, um, a it's called the Lausanne curve, which depicts the, um, a typical mining company stock price over time, including like the discovery where it shoots way, way up and then it comes back down. And then you do the feasibility study and then you go to finance to go to production and that usually kills the stock. And yet the uh, best time to invest is when all that bad news, quote unquote, is out. Uh, the company is fully financed and you actually have a good management team that you trust will be able to put the mine into production at the stated capital cost. And at that point in time, the company is always undervalued. Um, and uh, because now it becomes just a question of like, is it 18 months, two years to production? And you don't know when. It could be like a month before, three months before production, or six months before production, the stock all of a sudden so it starts to rise because people can see that the maximum NEV is actually the minute uh, before you start, you push the button and the thing starts producing. So. That to me is the most attractive uh, place to uh, get involved. You know, for example, when um, uh, Lucas Lundin was buying um, what became Lundin Gold um, asset in Ecuador, um, he had trouble getting you know people involved. And uh, you, you look at you know the resource, the reserve. It was incredible, like one of the best reserve in place, and uh, it was not fully financed and. So I remember saying to uh, Lucas, I'll, I'll buy, you know, 5% of the company uh, with you and I uh, will promote, but I want to have like Louis Gignac as your guy who's going to build a mine because I know he's going to build it, you know, on time, on budget. And I'd like to see uh, all the money in place. And uh, then we're off to the race. Well, the stock at that time was $4.50. And by the time it got to production, it was like $12. So. That is typical of where you can make like the most money in the mining business with the least risk. Um, where you got the maximum risk is, you know, at the very beginning, of course. And those are what I call the fireflies, okay? Um, there are thousands of them, you know, they, they have assays here, there, there, but uh, can they come up with, you know, like three, five million ounces, which is the minimum you need kind of today to be able to have sustainable production for like 15, 20 years. Otherwise you have like what we call in French, the minette, okay? Like the small mines. And those mines are not able to uh, support any shock, okay? Like, you know, you're down for two weeks because of your frame, your, your head frame, or because of this or because of that. You can never catch up. The, the mill is never big enough. The, Underground is never big enough to catch up and you can't really make any money with that. You may have a million ounces, but you're not going to go anywhere. And when you're looking at an explorer or a developer or a company that's about to go into production, what's important to you? Are you looking at jurisdiction, the management team, the grade? Uh, number one is management. Good people make good things happen. Bad people don't have to say the rest. So. Number one is really the management team. Uh, number two, I'd say uh, the asset. Um, if you have a, a thousand feet of one ounce gold, let me tell you, this thing's going to turn out to be a big thing, okay, just because of what it is, all right? 
And having world-class asset today is the most difficult thing to get to. So uh, I look for asset that are going to be in the 5 to 15 million ounce. Um, like that to me is very appealing if you can get to that those numbers. You're then in the top sort of like, you know, 1% of the, the gold asset in the world. Uh, and then jurisdiction, of course. Um, you know, I've never... Uh, Seymour and I used to joke that we will go anywhere in the world as long as you speak English, you have an English code of law, and where you can ski and play poker. Okay? That was very simple. Uh, yet, when you think about it, that's, uh, you know, Australia, Canada, the U.S., uh, there's a number of countries where, you know, uh, over time we've diversified, but there are a lot of countries where we would never go. Okay? Simply because... You know, if you don't trust the court system or the law, you have nothing. Uh, you can't move minds, okay? They, they have to be where they are. So um, for us, it's uh, very critical that um, you have a, uh, you know, a piece of paper that you can rely on should something happen. You made mention of how difficult it is to find a 5 or 10 million ounce reserve or resource. And I want to get your views on M&A because we've seen a lot of M&A in recent years with all the large producers, Newmont, Barrick, and Agnico have all been very acquisitive. Well, what are your views on this and why are they doing this? Is it because of valuation or is it because we're simply running out of gold? There's no more five or 10 million ounce reserves oh, I, to be I think found. there's plenty of uh, gold deposits to be found. Uh, but when it becomes cheaper to uh, buy the ounces on Bay Street uh, versus like finding them, it's normal. You know, you just go buy them. Uh, today, particularly over the last two, three, four, five years, uh, the junior market is just on its back and is having incredible difficulty attracting risk money. So the ounces that are selling in the market today, you can buy like reserve ounces for $50 an ounce. You can't find reserve ounces for $50 an ounce. So just go buy them. I mean, you know, that's really the motivation behind what's going on today. And do you think it's possible to find another gold strike? Oh, yeah. I mean, look at Canada as the second largest land mass in the world. Where do you find, you know, gold deposits? On land. Okay, and do you think that Canada's land mass has been explored? Not a chance. I mean, they're like huge area of Canada that have never seen boots, okay? They've never seen, you know, pairs of eyes. So I am absolutely convinced that there will be more great deposit to, to be found. Uh, but the cost today, because, you know, if you look at the, the Great White North, as we call it, there are no infrastructure. So you have to go by helicopter. Everything is, you know, helicopter supported. It costs a pile of money. And if the investors can't get a return out of it, they're not going to get the money. And that's really what's happening. That's why in Quebec, for example, Planol has been so popular because the mining companies now are able to drive and they're able to support exploration uh, based on road, which is like a fraction of the cost of being helicopter supported. Um, I think the, uh, if, uh, you know, Ontario ever gets its act together after 23 years, uh, you know, in uh, the ring of fire, you might see great discoveries over there. But, you know, in the meantime, it's too costly. You're not going to see exploration. And so that brings me to my next question, and that is performance or gold performance and also by extension, the performance of gold equities. And gold's done okay, but in this environment where we have this double-digit inflation, inflation running at 40-year highs, the money supply has doubled in the last four years. A lot of real assets have increased significantly in price, but gold really hasn't. How do you explain that? I would be very looking at it very differently than you are. I think you know gold this year will be at a nominal high in uh, in every in real term and in specific term. And if you can't make money with gold at two thousand dollars, you shouldn't be in this business. Okay, like you should be able to make a ton of money. And I would say if you look at the Agnico Eagle of the world and the Newmont, I mean they are making like really good money, and they should. 
Uh, however, gold equities are not priced as if gold is 2000. They're priced as if gold is going to be $1,500. There's a disbelief out there, and don't ask me why. I've never seen it in 40 years in the business of uh, like the gold equities lagging so badly on the uh, gold price itself. And when I look at you know 2024, 2025, I look at uh, the, uh, the, the setup in terms of uh, gold. The central banks are buying gold like there's no tomorrow. I mean, last year they bought like uh, over 1, 1,200 tons of gold out of supply of about 3,200. So think about this, like it's a third of all the gold produced last year went into central bank hands, okay? This year they're buying again, same thing, okay? Why? Because they want to diversify out of the U.S. dollar. They don't want as many dollars because the U.S. is kicking the living, you know, daylight out of everybody who doesn't agree with their policy. So they're saying, you know what, we like you, but we'd like to have gold because we can transit gold without you, uh, uh, you know, preventing us from doing so. And um, you look at, uh, I was saying, the budget deficit, the U.S., like $1.8 trillion this year. And for the next five years, the government forecasts itself like over $2 trillion a year. I mean, James, those numbers when I was a kid were reserved for astronomy. Okay, like think about this. I mean, they, they are so off the chart numbers. It's unbelievable. And all the politicians, they, what they do is, and it's, it's been like this for thousands of years. They kick the can down. They kick the can down the road. And all of a sudden it stops okay and nobody knows when i mean it's like you buying an, a you know fire insurance for your house you never want to see you know you cashing in on that policy but if it does you're happy to have your policy gold is a bit the same way over the next two or three years i think having gold in your portfolio will give you a great comfort that you know if as and when that can like is not kicked down the road you know, um, you're going to be very happy to have some gold in your portfolio. And I really believe that over the next three years, there's going to be one of this, you know, uh, black swan event that will kick the living daylight of the U.S. dollar. And that's what's going to propel gold higher because gold is the inverse of the U.S. dollar. OK, that's always been the relationship and will always be because the dollar is the reserve currency. When the dollar acts as a reserve currency that is solid, no inflation, you know, low budget deficit, if non-budget surpluses, you don't need gold, okay? But when the dollar becomes suspicious, that's when you want it. Pierre, we can't have a discussion on gold without talking about Bitcoin, and quite often Bitcoin is referred to as new gold or digital gold and it's performing significantly better than gold has in recent years. Do you think there's been less interest in gold and more interest placed on digital gold or Bitcoin for the same reasons that people used to invest in gold? Well, I think that there are two different markets altogether. Um, I mean, you don't see uh, Indian or Chinese buying uh, cryptos, okay? They buy gold, they trust gold. You don't see central banks buying cryptos, okay? They're buying gold. Uh, I think that the, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, crypto is a mathematical equation in space. Unplug your computer and what do you have? Nothing, okay? If you have no electricity, what do you have? Nothing, okay? With gold, you have it in your hands. You can take that one ounce and people will accept it anywhere in the world. With crypto, you know, you need an up, another crypto to buy or transfer, and then you need someone else who's going to be the intermediate to actually give you real money. Um, and all of that costs money. You know, there's immense friction in the whole crypto world. I mean, to my mind, um, if as and when the U.S. government puts regulation around crypto, it, it will cramp the crypto style pretty, pretty badly because it is being used for um, criminal activities. I've seen it with a few companies uh, that I am involved in, and uh, the payments are in crypto. Guess what, right? 
Uh, so um, I think once it's regulated, I think that it's going to become less interested. Most of the crypto are the Gen Z generation. They think that like it's their thing, their new thing. We'll see if it has any uh, duration. It's their new gold. Well, it's a it's a new asset class uh, like fungible, which you know, frankly, again, the market is very very narrow. Uh, you only you have very few people that have benefited from the entire crypto asset, and uh, versus gold, which is broadly broadly diversified around the world, trades twenty four hours a day and is part of culture. I mean, specifically in China, India, uh, Europe as well, um, you know, so, yeah. Pierre, you have created billions of dollars in shareholder wealth. You're still involved in numerous business ventures. You still go into the office on a regular basis. Where do you get your passion from and what gets you going in the morning? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I, I, you know, I'd like my um, tombstone to say that uh, I've made a difference in this world. And uh, to me, I have as much fun creating wealth as uh, giving it away. And uh, to my mind, uh, creating wealth is, uh, it is so incredibly satisfying to see uh, people you know, benefiting from the work that you, uh, that you do. I'll tell you one of the great very great story of, uh, of Franco Nevada. So every year uh, um, after the annual meeting, Seymour and I, this is back in the 90s, we used to throw a party uh, for our uh, major shareholders, the bankers, the analysts, uh, and uh, Seymour and I would do skits, okay? And we, uh, we had a friend who did stand-up comedy and like, so, so it was like a fun evening. And I remember in 1999, um, we um, had uh, rented the, uh, uh, the restaurant at the top of the old Four Seasons Hotel. And I went there before the dinner just to check on everything, like, you know, it was the, that'd be proper. And there was this um, older uh, waitress who was there, and she came over to me. And she said, uh, you're, you're Mr. Lasson. I said, yeah. And she said, um, and she had a very broken English, um, like, Eastern European, and she said, uh, well, um, I want to thank you. And I'm like, I thought she was thanking me for, like, you know, having her as part of the staff that night. She said, uh, back about um, 12 years ago, I, I read a, a, a something on your company in uh, The Sun, the newspaper The Sun. Seymour had a friend who used to write a Friday column, okay? And, uh, and like, he wrote it that month, the stock was like, I don't know, like 60 cents or so. And she said, uh, after I read that column, I put all my savings in your company. I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, what did you do? And she said, well, and, and because of you, she said, uh, last week, uh, I was able to buy a house. That is what we work for. When you're a CEO is what you have to keep in mind, is that you are working for the shareholders. And that's what creating wealth means, you know, to me. Um, and I've never forgotten that story. And I've had a few others, you know, of the kind over the years. And that's what animates me to create shareholder value. And that's what gets you going every morning? Every morning, exactly. It's what gets me. And then to turn around and be able to, you know, like give the money away, which is not easy. People think like writing a check is easy. It's not because, again, you're trying to create something that doesn't exist. You're trying to help organization get better. You're trying to help people, essentially. Again, it's always about people. If, if you can write a check that comes with a commitment, a time, a talent commitment, and you, where you can make a difference, it that makes the whole difference in the world. So it keeps me busy, 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 busy. And Pierre, do you still have a passion to find the next big discovery, the next gold strike? 
Oh, yes, 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 yes. So um, back about two years ago, uh, one of the individual that uh, I was involved back in the 90s when we created Metallica, which became um, New Gold today, uh, came to me and said, Pierre, we have this concession in Chile and we have like a thousand feet of 0.73 percent. Uh, no, not a kilometer, a kilometer thick intercept of 0.75, 0.78 percent copper. I said, you got to be kidding. I, and again, like it's all about the size of the rock package. That gives you an idea of where things are going. So anyway, I helped them, um, and uh, this company, we've raised them, like, I don't know, about 50, 60 million since then. And they're now up at like 1.4 billion tons of 0.75% copper. I mean, like, you're talking here, a major, major new discovery. And it keeps getting bigger and bigger, and that's so much fun. You know, to me, that's like being 18 years old all your life, okay? Like, you know, it's, uh, I, I love that. Pierre, as we wrap up, you have spent a good portion of your life focused on gold and royalties. If you were 20 years old again, would you do anything different? Would you focus on maybe a different metal or maybe a different sector altogether? Oh, I would stay in the mining business. I think that uh, the mining business offers, uh, you know, like I love traveling. I've been to 117 countries in the world, mostly because of mining. And uh, to me, to my mind, there's no better, you know, profession. I, I love the uh, wealth that we create for not only the shareholders, but the community where we work. We, you know, spend enormous amount of time finding these deposits and then developing them and then like creating the best paid jobs and color blue worker job in the world, anywhere we go. And, uh, you know, immense community benefit as well. Um, I would do exactly the same thing. I, I have absolutely like no desire to be in any other businesses. I stick with what I know and uh, I would stick with it. And the royalty business was a great new um, invention. I think that the royalty model is the best business model on the planet, bar, bar none. I mean, think about this, like Franco Nevada, revenue will be like a billion dollars with 42 employees. It's a fabulous business model and that's why we've been copied. Today there's like 52, three, four, five companies that are trying to emulate us. Uh, but we had a 20 year lead. Like, you know, for, for 10 years, nobody thought we could do anything. And then for another 10 years, it was only one other company who followed us. And that gives us an enormous lead time to accumulate the whole bunch of land. And so today we have like 10 million acres in the best royalty district of the world. And you can't replace that. Uh, so um, I, I would, you know, try to do the same thing in the same business. Absolutely. 100%. So no interest going into artificial intelligence or cryptocurrencies? Definitely not cryptos, no. And uh, no, artificial intelligence, uh, not for me. Uh, but I, I'm happy to use it. Uh, and I think artificial intelligence will be incredibly useful at the exploration stage. Uh, particularly, we need it. Exploration today needs a, a, a game changer in terms of uh, how we explore because the drill rigs, They've been in existence for 100 years. We haven't found any other way to like look for a deposit. Um, and the, uh, the technology that we use in terms of geophysics, I mean, it's, it's a lot better than it was like 10, 20, 30 years ago. But it's nowhere near good enough as it is, for example, for the oil business. So I think AI will prove to be incredibly useful uh, for uh, exploration. It may be what the industry needs to finally get money back and actually produce return uh, because that's what's been lacking is like a real return for the shareholders. Uh, so um, I'm hoping that uh, that's going to make a difference. Well, Pierre, that was a fascinating discussion and I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. Pleasure. Thank you, Jane.